At a meeting on Monday of the U.S.-China Business Council, Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi called on both countries to remove obstacles and achieve a smooth transition in relations. In the past week, however, the outgoing Trump administration has hardened its stance, introducing fresh anti-China measures. Is President Trump trying to make it politically untenable for the Biden administration to change course, as some analysts are saying? Is he trying to make his hawkish China policy the new normal, or is he trying to make it impossible for Biden to govern effectively? Joining me for the discussion in Beijing is Professor Wang Yiwei from Reming University of China and from Washington, D.C., Rick Dunham of the Global Business Journalism Program at uh, Tsinghua University. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. So, uh, Foreign Minister, State Thank Councillor you. Wang Yi's key message is that China looks to build a healthy relationship with the United States. He said that uh, the top priority is that both sides shall work together to remove all kinds of disruptions and obstacles and achieve a smooth transition in China-U.S. relations. China and the United States should work in a direction that serves the common interests of the both of the two countries and people so that the two sides can restart dialogue, rebuild mutual trust, and get bilateral ties back on track. Professor Wang, what message is uh, Wang Yi, or China rather, sending despite current tensions? What about the damage that has already been done to bilateral ties? I think it's very clear that uh, the Chinese side want to reset its relations with the United States, uh, which uh, showed in the shadow by the Trump administration in the first four years. So globalization, we will continue to uh, do business with the United States. We can reform the globalization. Uh, well, of course, there's competition, uh, but this is a competitive, uh, it's a competitive cooperation with the United States. What about the damage that has been done to bilateral ties? Is China ready to overlook these damages and say, okay, let's put our differences aside, let's try to rebuild things? Because um, Mr. Wang basically is very open, right? He, he reiterated China's willingness to put everything on the table and keep the door open, showing the utmost sincerity and goodwill to engage with the United States. Mr. Wang. Yes, the damage is very uh, serious uh, to the China-U.S. relations. Uh, even uh, Trump left uh, uh, the White House, the Biden doctrine or the Biden reason, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> the Trump reason, uh, still there. Uh, so that's very important because he still uh, they got uh, more than uh, 70 uh, million uh, you know, uh, voters, which against the globalization. Uh, the Biden, uh, the, as in behind it, Biden is Wall Street, Sig Valley uh, is a support of the globalization, which also uh, looks to the Chinese open reform, uh, politically for the financial reform. Uh, but still, the Biden will be a very weak president. In his uh, maybe in the uh, one year coming, he, uh, his priorities want to deal with the domestic challenge, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the situation, the pandemic, and also economic, and also uh, the dividing uh, society, and also climate change. Uh, China can work together with the United States. Uh, some many tough issues, we cannot help so much. Hmm. Rick, what is your take on China's repeated and persistent message that we want to talk, we want to keep the door open? Uh, China said that to the Trump administration last year, and China is reiterating this message, I believe, to the incoming Biden administration. Well, it's, it's a precondition for improved relations that China is willing to improve relations. For example, China and Iran are two very difficult situations for uh, President-elect Biden. Uh, China has reached out, Iran has not. So that means that there is potential uh, for uh, restoring some of the relations. But I think what leaders in Beijing need to realize is this is not the status quo ante, meaning things are not going to go back to the way they were when Barack Obama was president. I mean, things have happened in China and in the world. Uh, from the pandemic uh, to what's happening in Xinjiang and Hong Kong and Taiwan. And so I think that this is a complicated situation. And goodwill is the first, uh, the, the, the first requirement. Uh, but I think it's going to be small steps to restore trust. And I think that the economic relationship has, has been altered significantly uh, over, this, over this decade to one much more of 
competition and cooperation. And I think the two nations have to figure out a way for both to happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. They cooperate where they can, and they com and they compete uh, on on many other in m many other areas. Yeah. Well, it seems that the outgoing Trump administration is, uh, or some people in that administration, and uh, I think many people know who I'm talking about, are trying to make things as difficult as possible. So, um, Foreign Minister Wang Yi highlighted the importance of dialogue at all levels, uh, including interpersonal exchange. However, uh, last Friday, the Trump administration ended five cultural exchange programs that it claims were used as soft power propaganda tools by the Chinese government. These programs um, that uh, the State Department ended include the Policy Makers Educational China Trip Program, the U.S.-China uh, Friendship Program, the U.S.-China Leadership Exchange Program, and the U.S.-China Trans-Pacific Exchange Program, and the Hong Kong Educational and Cultural Program. So, Rick, why these programs? What do we know about these programs, and why do you think the U.S. is looking at them as some kind of soft power propaganda tools? How do you define such a label? Well, I, I, anything soft, soft power uh, and propaganda are, are the positive and negative words to, you, to describe the same thing. And it's person to person, it's, it's agency to agency, uh, getting to know people and breaking, breaking through uh, mutual distrust. I happen to think that even if uh, these things are tools of propaganda, just as American uh, soft power uh, outreach in China, some of the partnerships might be construed as that by some of the Chinese government, this is a good thing. It, I, I, just, I just personally believe that even if it is a tool of, uh, of propaganda, uh, that this is something that both countries should try to understand uh, the other. But I think that your big point is very important, which is that the Trump administration is trying to make life as difficult as possible for Joe Biden when he comes in. They're trying to do so many things that he will have a hard time unwinding them. At the same time, they're trying to show Donald Trump is president until January 20th, and he's going to continue with his priorities. So I, th I think that some of it is to, to make Joe Biden's transition very difficult, but other is just to do as much as they can. Uh, you could say damage, or you could say just to, to reinforce the Trump philosophy of, uh, of anti-China anti, uh, actions to match his rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Does it uh, matter? who exactly are behind these moves because there are analysts who have pointed out that it's actually Secretary of State um, Mike Pompeo who have right. masterminded, who are pushing these moves. Uh, Mr. Wang, how do you look at uh, the, you know, the, the, the fact that some people are pointing out this is Mike Pompeo's work and why does that matter? I don't think it's just about uh, Pompeo's personal or Trump's his, uh, personal uh, attitude towards China. The United States is very divided. Uh, the benefit from the globalization or suffered from the globalization. And the thing about China is the most beneficial country from the globalization. So China be the uh, scapegoat of globalization. So those who hate globalization and hate China. And uh, uh, also China be the scapegoat of American domestic politics even. Uh, so many uh, difficulties that they want to find China as a target. Uh, actually. Uh, like the Trump in the past uh, four years, uh, the trade war, all these cannot solve the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, domestic problems. So, but they need the target, they need scapegoat. Mm. So you're actually saying that um, it doesn't really matter whether it is one single person or a few person of that administration. It reflects the, uh, the idea of uh, quite a sector of the U.S. population or politicians at least. Um, uh, for sure, this particular officer last Thursday, John Ratcliffe, director of the U.S. National Intelligence, uh, stepped up the Trump administration's attacks against China in an article in the Wall Street Journal. He wrote, the People's Republic of China poses the greatest threat to America today and the greatest threat to democracy and freedom worldwide since World War II. Beijing intends to dominate the U.S. and the rest of the planet economically, militarily and technologically. Many of China's major public initiatives and prominent companies offer only a layer of camouflage to the activities of the Chinese Communist Party. Rick, how do you look at the timing of such rhetoric, of such an article, and what do you make of his remarks? 
Well, first, what you have to realize is this represents the Trump philosophy. And with China, you have uh, Ratcliffe and Pompeo. But the same kind of thing is happening with civil rights, with the environment. Uh, he, has, he has empowered people who tend to be pretty extreme to do as much as they can between now and January 20th. I mean, I, I, I think the Ratcliffe speech is more significant than some of Pompeo's remarks because it's so over the top. I mean, whatever you think about the challenges that the Chinese government uh, and the Chinese economic growth uh, places on the United States, to say this is the biggest threat to world peace and freedom since the Second World War is way over the top. I mean, if, if, the, if you talked about the Cold War and the Soviet Union, that was, that, that was a government that wanted uh, worldwide revolution. China wants econo economic uh, growth, eco even economic dominance, but it, it is not saying that every government in the world uh, should change to represent the Chinese model. So while, while I think that there is legitimate room for discussion about uh, Chinese competition, economic competition uh, and global outreach, I, I think it's way over the top to say that this is the biggest threat to freedom in the, in the, in the world uh, in the past 80 years. Professor Wang, how do you look at uh, what's going to come over the next few weeks until inauguration day for Joe Biden? People are calling this uh, the scorched earth uh, tactic of the Trump administration, leaving everything uh, destroyed, burning everything that's, uh, that could be useful for the enemy while they retreat. What do you think of that? Uh, I think it's not just uh, uh, Trump's uh, so-called legacy uh, be the upscale for Biden to reset relations with China. Uh, I think his supporters, uh, the, uh, the United States, are actually very nervous about China because of the pandemic to show that the Chinese uh, political system is most efficient to control the pandemic and also the Chinese circular uh, civilization that uh, we are not so much like the United States to uh, think about the so-called privacy and uh, they think about the God bless. So that reason, I think, uh, they, and also digitalized. Uh, this makes the U.S. I think is very nervous about that. This year, uh, China's GDP will pass the United States more than 70 percent. Next year, it will be 75 percent uh, because China's economic growth will be reaching more than 8 uh, percent. Uh, by 2035, according to our uh, long-term uh, plan, maybe the United States uh, GDP by 2035 will be the 75 percent of China. So this never happened in history. Uh, when Americans second to none, city upon the hill. So this is a uh, American secularism, uh, very religion thinking, cannot accept that China is not a, uh, we believe, different God. Even some Chinese even don't believe any God. So this is kind of a huge challenge to the United States. I think the, uh, Biden or uh, Trump all be living in the shadow of that kind of uh, uh, China threat. Mm -hmm. Well, China um, is not wanting to dominate anybody. I think China just want to to ahead to develop itself to live a better life and even if China gets over uh, gets bigger than the United States on a per capita level it is still really a fraction of uh, the, the, the per capita GDP level of the United States so um, there's still a, a long way to go I, I, many people here really don't understand why Americans are so afraid of Chinese or afraid of uh, Chinese people Chinese companies I think uh, we're going to continue having this discussion in the time to in the near future to come but many thanks to Professor Wang Yiwei at the Remy University of China and to Rick Dunham joining us from Washington DC of Tsinghua University